Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that you're a God who gave us, you gave us the scriptures, and the scriptures talk about all kinds of things in life. We pray for your grace. We pray for your mercy. God, I pray for clarity today as we talk about a sensitive subject, a topic that affects all of us. God, we just ask that you would, you would speak to every single person in a way that we need to hear, God. Challenge us, comfort us. We look to you. We love you, God. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. 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 So we're beginning this series. This is about relationships. And uh, this weekend, I mean, what a great time to begin a relationship series. Valentine's weekend, huh? Everybody have a good Valentine's Day? Or Single Awareness Day, as it's also called? Everybody? So I just thought, I just thought, because I love my church, that maybe I would share with you a little bit of the Valentine's magic from the years past between Michelle and I, as in a poem. So you're like, what do we go? A poem. So it, if it's okay with you guys, would you like to hear a little bit? I have an old poem that I wrote for Michelle on Valentine's back when we were dating. It, would you guys like to hear just a little taste of the, of the love and the magic in our relationship? Yeah. Yes, four of you? Five? I, I, look, we don't have to do this. I thought it was a treat. We're just... Oh, now you're getting excited. Now, all right. All right. All right. All right. You, you twisted my arm. I tell you what. In order to do this, um, I'm going to... Hey, Alex, are you back? Yeah, there he is. There he is. Everybody give it up for Alex. <clears throat> have you got any, uh, like, um, look, this is a Valentine poem, something... Something nice, if you could just get going there. I've, I've, titled this, um, I've titled this, Just For You. Just For You. It's actually, I know you can't quite see this if you're on the front row. I drew a rose. You guys see this? That's serious artistry right there. It's for my girl, my boo. It says, to Michelle, just in case, you know. I didn't want her to forget who this was for. Love, Jeff. So, has anyone here ever written a poem to somebody, like a love kind of poem? Okay. All right. So you know, this, this is about a, the most vulnerable moment I could have right here, sharing this with you guys. That sounds great. <laughs> sounds good. <clears throat> Just for you. Just for you. <laughs> okay, here we go. Here, I can do this. Compose myself. To express in words my feelings for you is simply impossible. No words would do. To show you how I feel inside my heart still can't be done, where would I start? You guys see my, my, my rhyming, my cadence? <laughs> Takes skills. How do I tell you just how I feel? Love is inside of me. I know it is real. What is that? What are you, have you no heart? <clears throat> Where was I? Okay, here we go. Time sometimes comes when things aren't the best. I treat you wrong and make you depressed. <laughs> I mean, you know, if you can work depressed in a Valentine's poem, you're, that takes skills. So obviously, I did something. This is one of those makeup poems. All right. If, only, if you only knew how mad I could be, not at you or others, just at me. <laughs> I, I want you to know how much I care. I will rub your back and play with your hair. <laughs> I know how to make up. Making up leads to making out if you do it right. So... I don't always seem to be 100% true. I want you to know, though, I'll always love you. Wait, it's not done. Wait for the zinger, all right? From one heart to another, please always be mine. I love you so much, my precious Valentine. There you have it, everybody. Thank you so much, Alex. I will have this on Craigslist later tonight, some of you guys. You're welcome. You can, you can take that and use it. <laughs> oh, man. Dating. How many of you remember the first date you ever went on? Anybody remember your very first date? Some of you tried to forget. My first date, I believe, was sixth grade. Now, I'm not, I'm not condoning dating in sixth grade. If you're in sixth grade and you're here and you're like, see, Mom, he went. I'm not saying it's okay. Not, not endorsing this. But I was in sixth grade, 
and I'm pretty sure I lied to my mom and had her drop me off at the mall to hang out with friends where I met a girl. I'm not going to say her name because somebody will look her up on Facebook and then it'll get weird because she'll listen to this. And, 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 and so we got to the, the mall where there was a movie theater and I bought my ticket. She bought hers. Obviously, I didn't have much money. And uh, we, we went to see the movie Beetlejuice, right? Nothing like a romantic movie like Beetlejuice. And she dumped me a few days after that, um, probably because I was too cheap to buy her ticket. I remember that, right? I mean, remember when you would go out, but you didn't actually go anywhere, right? Remember you were, were you, you know, it's like, are you guys going out? I'm like, yeah, where are you going? Nowhere. But we're going out. It, it was so different back in the day, back in my day. I mean, like, like back, back when, back, back when you would just, you'd send somebody that you like, you just send them a letter, like, like through a courier service of like your friends, right? Remember, and the letter would just simply say, I like you. Do you like me? Check yes or no. And it's no big deal if they said no. You just wrote another one to somebody else. Send it off to the next. And you're like, I, could, I got people, man. I could go for days just sending out invites. And if somebody said yes, then we were going out, right? We were going out for a while. And, and going out has changed. Like dating is different now. And you got like technology. You can text people and there's social media. I mean, Facebook, it just changes everything. Like dating is so complicated these days. Right? I mean, think about it. If you see somebody that you're interested in, you got to like, first you got to figure out who they are, and then you got to, then you go online, right? You go on Facebook and you begin to check out their profile, don't you? Start reading up on their profile, you look at their pictures, and, uh, and so you, you kind of stalk them digitally, right? I mean, we wouldn't call it that, but that's pretty much what it is, right? So you're looking at the profile and all of a sudden you're like, hey, this seems like somebody I'd like to get to know more. And you have that moment where you've got to send them a friend request, you know what I'm talking about? And you're like, I mean, they could turn me down right now. So this is kind of like a, like a pre-invite, right? Like, so, you, you know, you hit the friend request and they accept it. And then, you, you know, now you can like see their stuff and, and you, you, you like their status every now and again. You even comment on a few things. Not everything because that gets creepy. That's still too aggressive, too quick. But then if there's something there, then you kind of take it to the next level where you actually have a conversation. Like face-to-face talking or maybe over the phone and... And, and so, you know, you find out, hey, we got some, there's, there's, there's some interest here. And you go out on a date or maybe two. And, and then there's that magic moment when you have to update your status. You guys know that? You know what I'm talking about? You got to go in there and you change it from single to in a relationship. And that's a big deal because once you do that, like everybody knows. See, when I was dating, you're like your status, it never changed. You didn't worry about it. I mean, you know, if anything, you, you just, you, you folded your letters a little more cool. Like, you guys remember when you used to fold letters? Guys, we only folded them to look like paper footballs. That's all we could do. Girls, it looked like an arrow. It looked like a pterodactyl. I mean, it was all kinds of, we did paper footballs and, and that was it. But, but now, you, you know, you go online and you change your status from single to in a relationship and all your friends are like, whoa so excited for you guys and then it changes back to single again and they're like ah she wasn't good for you anyway and to which then you get back together which made that a little awkward and now you're in a relationship and then it breaks up again and so you just you just set it to say it's complicated it's complicated which by the way if you're in a relationship and you change your status to say it's complicated without having a conversation with them it's about to get really complicated and here's the thing Here's the thing, when it comes to dating, dating can just be complicated. It can just be odd. As a matter of fact, if you have one of these handouts that was on your seat, we went ahead and printed out the notes. I believe this series is going to be so powerful. We're going to have notes for you each week to fill in the blank so you don't miss anything. But one thing I want you to notice on here is this passage from Proverbs chapter 30, verses 18 through 19. And in Proverbs, Proverbs is known as a wisdom book. It's got a lot of wisdom for us on how to live life, how to navigate life. And so the writer of this proverb, his name is Agur, and he's writing about things that just he just can't seem to wrap his mind around. They just don't make sense. And look at what he says. He says, there are three things that amaze me. No, time out. Four things that I don't understand. Four things that just, they boggle my mind. Look at what he says. How an eagle glides through the sky, right? You ever seen an eagle just soaring through the sky? That's, how does it do that? It's amazing. And then he goes on and says, how a snake slithers on a rock. I don't like snakes, period, so that doesn't make sense to me. And then he says, look, I don't understand how a ship navigates the ocean. Right? If you've ever been so far out in the water that you can't see the shore, like how does it navigate the ocean? And then he says, here's the fourth thing I don't understand. How a man loves a woman. 
Now, he's not just saying women are complicated and therefore we don't understand that. What he's saying is, I don't understand relationships, how a couple falls in love. Like, that just is beyond me. I mean, eagles, snakes, ships, love, four things that I just can't grasp. Well, here's what's interesting is he wrote that 2,500 years ago. And over 2,500 years, we still can't figure out how relationships work. I mean, we're still scratching our head. I mean, poets and philosophers and wise men have tried to figure this thing out, and we just can't get it. I mean, matter of fact, Hathaway asked, What is love? Baby, don't hurt me. Don't hurt me. Right? I mean, that's such a tricky thing. Is, you know, what is love? And then Foreigner declared, I want to know what love is. Right? We all want to know what love is. Jefferson Airplane posed the question, Don't you want somebody to love? Yeah, right? We all do. All of us, we do. And then there's poor Johnny Lee who said that he was, I was looking for love in all the wrong places. The wrong places. Looking for love too. And now, see, here's the thing. You go looking for love in all the wrong places, you wind up like Beyonce. Got her crazy, and you go crazy long enough, you wind up like Maroon 5, and you say, This love has taken its toll. Taking its toll. Taking its toll, and it's, it's worn him down. I, you know, I, I think that there's few people out there that can sum up our feelings on love like Young MC. On a mission and you're wishing someone could cure your lonely condition. Looking for love in all the wrong places. There we go. We're on a mission and we're wishing someone could cure our lonely condition. And, and the truth of the matter is love is a crazy thing. Dating can be a crazy thing. And love makes us do crazy things. Right? I mean, think about how we describe love. Right? We say love is what comes to mind. Love is blind. Right? Like, we didn't see it coming. I never saw this happening. It's why we say, I fell in love, right? We fall in love. We fall out of love. Last time I checked, falling's not a good thing, right? Can we all agree? I mean, if you fall repeatedly, you need to get that checked out. Something's not right. And so this series is about giving us just, just a handful of insights that I think are going to help us navigate the most important decisions we're ever going to make in life, help us uncomplicate what's become extremely complicated. So here's who this series is for. I don't want anybody kind of checking out, thinking, well, maybe this series isn't for me. Listen, this series, if you're here today, you're single, and you'd like to be married someday, you want to be in a relationship, this series is for you. If maybe you are currently in a relationship, you're dating or you're engaged, you think you found the one, this series is going to be extremely helpful. Maybe today you say, you know what, I've been married, I'm not married now, so like I've been there, done that, got the t-shirt, I dropped it off at Goodwill, don't want another one, right? <laughs> Look, I hear you, but I think this series is going to be extremely helpful. Maybe you're here today and you say, you know what, my marriage isn't what I thought it was going to be, and, and um, I don't know how much more I can take of this. Listen, I think this is going to be a great series for you. If you're here today and you say, man, I've got a marriage, and it's awesome. Like, it's everything I dreamed of. I think that this series is going to make your marriage even more awesome. And so I don't want you to miss a single week of this series. It's going to be so helpful. Now, I don't think everybody's going to like this series, though. All right? There are some that are just going to be like, I'm not going to like this series. And you may be here today, and, and I just want you to know, I'm glad you're here. If you're the kind of person that, like, dating is a game for you, like, you, you date for sport, it's kind of like, I'm in a relationship to see what I can get. It's about me, and I'm going to go out with this girl so that I can get satisfied and have my needs met, and then ditch her for another one. You might not like this series a lot. If you're the kind of person where it's like, you know, my goal is I want to, you know, meet somebody at the bar, get them drunk, take them home, and leave them the next day. Listen, you're not going to like this series a whole lot. And, and matter of fact, we've got a team of guys that would love to, to meet you and lay hands on you and pray for you <laughs> out back. Uh, I say that kind of joking. But, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. I'm super glad you're here. I'm super glad you're here. You know, we all come from different backgrounds with different experiences. And, you know, if you're here and maybe you say, you know, I'm not, I'm not looking for a relationship. I'm not even interested. I'm looking to have my needs met and to get what I can. Listen, you, I believe you're here for a reason. And what my encouragement to you would be go home, go home tonight and begin downloading the podcast throughout this series. And I know you don't have much of an interest now, but I know that someday, someday this lifestyle is going to get exhausting. And you're going to have a moment where you wake up and go, you know what, I'm sick of this. I'd really love to settle down. I'd love to find somebody. I'd love to be in a relationship. And, and, and at that point, you're going to go, man, there was that time I went to church, 
And that guy, I don't remember his name or the church, but he talked about dating and it was somehow being complicated. And at that point, you can pull the podcast back out and you can play them again. And I believe it's going to help you at that point in life. Because this is what I know about life. Someday down the road, your present, like this moment, will be in your past. And your past will have shaped your present. Which means the decisions we're making today have incredibly huge implications on our life tomorrow. Understand this. When it comes to dating, the choices we make today impact us now and later. Now and later. You guys remember the candies? Now and later. You'd eat them now and pick them out of your teeth for hours later. (laughs) This message has the power to impact your life now and later. And so just hang on to it. And so if you're here and you're like, "Um, you know, my girlfriend said I had to come. It's about relationships. Just trust me. What we're going to share tonight and the next couple weeks has the power to transform your life has the power to put you in a position to experience relationships that really do go the distance. And so I'm going to share with you things that I've learned over the years of being a pastor, being a youth pastor, things I've learned about relationships, about marriages. You know, I've had the chance of talking to newly married, soon to be married, once was married, happily married couples. And can I tell you what I've learned about marriage and marriage problems over the years? Here's what I've learned. I've learned that most marriage problems are not actually marriage problems. Did you know that? Most of the things that we tend to have issues with in marriage are not actually marriage problems. You know what they are? They're single people problems that we brought to the altar and then into the relationship with us. Because you know what marriage problems are? Marriage problems are not deal breakers. Marriage problems are like, honey, which way does the toilet paper go? Does it go from the back to the front or the front to the back? That's a marriage problem. A marriage problem is... My husband keeps squeezing the toothpaste from the middle of the tube, not from the end, right? That's a marriage problem. A marriage problem is where are we going to spend Christmas vacation, at your parents or my parents? You see, those are marriage problems. But those aren't the kind of things that derail our relationships. What derail our relationships are problems we have in our life that we never deal with. And we have this idea that when I get married, they'll magically go away. But what happens is we get married and they just magnify and they become bigger and bigger issues. And that's why we got to understand that what we do today, the decisions we make today have a huge, a huge, a huge implication on the, on, on the relationship that we have later. And so we're going to deal with like real deal problems. And how do we How do we set ourselves up for successful dating, successful marriage, a relationship that goes the distance? So so this series, we're going to help with dating, marriage, sex. These are things that I don't want anybody in here to to mess up. I don't want you to have to have a do-over. I want you to be able to get this right the first time. And so I want you to take your paper out. And here's, here's one of the biggest problems that I see when it comes to dating in relationships. I want you to write this down. One of the biggest problems in dating that leads to failed marriages is what I call the right person myth. The right person myth. Here's what the right person myth is. Write this down. The right person myth says, if I find the right person, everything will be all right. If I find the right person, everything will be all right. Say it with me. If I find the right person, everything will be all right. So if I can just meet the right person, right? If I can just find that individual. Now, there's 7 billion people, but they're out there. And if I can just find them, then we're going to be set. We're going to have a marriage made in heaven, and it's going to be amazing. But if you ever stop to wonder, how will I know when I met the right person? All right, that's a good question. How do we know? Well, here's how we know. Chemistry, right? Right? There's, there's chemistry. You ever met somebody, and man, there was just chemistry, instant chemistry. And you just hit it off from day one. You know, you're like, you know, we talked for hours, hours on the phone. I'm not a talker, but I talked for hours and I just can't get him out of my head or I just can't get her off of my mind. And we have so much in common and man, it just feels right. You know, I've never felt like this before. My heart jumping out of my chest. It's like electricity every time we're together. And, you know, you just think I can't fight this feeling any longer. And yet I'm still afraid to let it go. What started out as friendship has grown stronger. I only wish I had the strength to let, to let it show. That's some REO speed wagon for the older folks here, okay? Well, something for the older folks. And young folks are like, what is this speed wagon? Right? We, we, we think about the chemistry. Man, if there's chemistry, then it must, 
be right. And so here's what happens. This is what happens. I'm not saying this is your relationship. This is the typical relationship. Typically, you have this couple that meets, and there's this chemistry, and things feel right, and there's fireworks, and they're thinking, I've met the right person. There's something different about this person. And so all of a sudden, you know, it's like, well, we've got to get to know each other better. And, and oftentimes a couple will say, well, the way we're going to get to know each other better is to move in together. Or, or you know, we live in a culture that says you got to try it before you buy it, right? You're not going to you know, buy a car without putting a few miles on it. You wouldn't, you wouldn't buy a pair of shoes without trying them on. And so we live in a culture that says if we're going to find out if we're compatible, then we've got to begin to try things out and we become intimate with one another. And, and I want to tell you, I believe there's a much better way. I believe Scripture says there's a better way. But this, is a, this tends to be the default manner in our culture and in our society today. And so here's what happens. This couple begins to move in together. They begin to sleep together. They begin to become intimate. And everything is exciting. Man, I mean, it's off the charts, and it's just like I've met the person of my dreams, and, you know, they pick up the phone and call mom at home, and they're like, Mom, I've, I've met the right person. I've met somebody that's they're different. They're, there's something about this person. They're, they're, you know, nobody has ever been in love like this before. You ever thought that in a relationship? You know, you're thinking, we're made for each other. You know, they're my soulmate. You had me at hello, right? You complete me. And all of a sudden, we begin thinking, like, this is, this is, is just, it just feels so right. And this couple goes off, and they begin to plan for this incredible wedding, this perfect day. Which one thing I found so interesting because of all the, the weddings that I've had the chance to be a part of is the amount of time and energy and money that a couple will put into planning for their wedding, but they fail to plan for their marriage. And it happens all the time. Because there's this incredible chemistry, we just, we just feel right. No one's ever been in love like this before. And so this couple has this wedding day of their dreams and this honeymoon of their dreams. And then they get back home to life as normal. And they begin to discover that it, maybe it wasn't so amazing after all. And the chemistry begins to fade. And they begin to experience bumps in the road because that's part of marriage is dealing with bumps in the road, dealing with conflict, understanding that you're not the same. And in dating, everybody puts their best foot forward. And here's what happens. This couple that is so enamored with the chemistry and the romance and the passion suddenly begins to feel the chemistry slip a little bit. And the romance isn't quite the same. And Romeo is not quite the Romeo. And Juliet's not quite the Juliet. And things get a little bit common and ordinary and all of a sudden there's conflict and they know there's conflict but they don't know how to fix it and the guy says well I know how to fix it we just need to have more sex right because for the guys that's the answer to our problems you know honey is everything okay no but I think I know how to fix it and so that's our solution to most everything and she's thinking uh -uh, no that's not the answer because you know if you would romance me more and then maybe there'd be more of that but you're not romancing me and topic for a whole nother day and so all of a sudden, neither of them are happy in this relationship. And what brought them this satisfaction is not there anymore. And fast forward a couple of weeks to months, and all of a sudden, you know, one of them says, I, I think I know how to fix the relationship. Now, it's usually the wife that throws, throws this out there and says, you know, I think I know what will draw us closer together. Why don't we have a baby? Now, the single people here are like, are you kidding me? Are you smoking crack? What? Do people think that? The married folks are like, honey, just look straight ahead. Don't, if, just look straight ahead. Nobody will know that he's talking about us. Because it happens, and it happens a lot. And we think, what could draw us closer together than bringing another human into the home? Because that will cause us to feel like a family. It's going to be great. And it happens, guys. It happens all the time. Now, one thing I do want to say, and I just want to say this, and you ladies, you're going to want to like hate me for saying this, but did you know that there are two, statistically speaking, there are two to three times in the life of a guy when he is most tempted to cheat on his wife can you think of what probably one of those top ones are? When she's pregnant. Now, you ladies are like, I would rip that joker's eyes out. <laughs> like, for real. And, and here's the thing. I, I'm not, I am not justifying this at all, at all. But here's how the guys tend to, tend to combat that. They say, well, but, but, but I have needs. For real? <laughs> Bro, air is a need. Water is a need. It is scientifically proven that you can go your entire life without having sex and still live a healthy existence. Now, I understand desire. I'm a dude, okay? I have been married. This summer will be 17 years. I get it. It's a big deal. But it doesn't justify anything. And, and I know you ladies are like, guys, they're scum. No, they're not. All of them 
or not. And we're going to talk a lot more about sex on week three. And I'm going to tell you, be early. It'll be packed that day. <laughs> I think that's a hot topic. So here's the deal. Here's our couple. Here's our couple, and the romance is fading, and the intimacy's not there, but they've got a baby now, and so they're not getting sleep either. And all he can do is get up in the morning and drag himself to the office where he gets a moment of kind of sanity, and you know who's at the office waiting for him? His coworker, who <laughs> was not pregnant, and suddenly compliments everything he does, acknowledges how hard he works, and he's one of the most hardworking people on the team, and have you been going to the gym, and you look like you've been getting kind of fit, and she laughs at all of his jokes, and you know what he begins to think? Oh my goodness, that's the right person. I married the wrong person. And around the same time, guess what his wife gets? A friend request from an old ex from high school. And isn't it amazing the way just a simple invitation brings back a lot of feelings? And she remembers the good times and the laughter and the chemistry. And she begins to think, I married the wrong person. And before long, we have a culture that says, you know what? Marriage today doesn't work. I mean, it's outdated. It's old-fashioned. It's not something that works anymore. And the reason we believe that is because we've bought this myth that there's a right person. If we could just find the right person, everything will be all right. You see, we're doing this series because I don't believe this has to be your story. I don't believe that your story has to be like this. Some of us, some of you came from a home that was broken and you watched your parents separate. Can I tell you, that doesn't have to be your story. That doesn't have to be yours. Some of you, you've gone through your first marriage and you're, you're in a relationship now. And can I tell you, your first marriage may have, may have been a rough one. But this one that you're getting ready to go into doesn't have to be. It can be different. Now, statistically speaking, your second marriage doesn't stand the chance your first marriage had. And your third is even worse than that. But I want to tell you that when we choose to honor God and do things His way, we can experience His hand of blessing on our relationship. There's another story, but you've got to choose it. You've got to choose to have a better story. See, bottom line is, in this church, there are tons, tons of great marriages. In our world today, there are tons of great marriages, marriages that have gone 40, 50, 60 years madly in love. But see, here's the problem. Nobody wants to make shows and movies about those marriages, right? They're boring. They seem boring. Like if they produced a Netflix marathon of my life, none of you would watch it. You just wouldn't. You'd be like, oh, yawn, right? You wouldn't get caught up in a binge episode watching of the Capusta life. Right? You, you'd be like, okay, hey, look, 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 his alarm's going off at 6.15. He's getting up. He's getting ready to go to the gym. Watch this. He's getting ready to go to the gym. He's drinking his pre-workout. Look at that. Look at, that. Look at him getting his car. Always heading out to the gym, trying to stay in shape. Oh, oh, look, he's coming back from the gym, and he's nasty and sweaty. Oh, look, look, he's, he sees his wife. He's giving his wife a hug. Oh, she's kind of like, oh, okay, a little sweaty, but okay. Oh, that's sweet. That's sweet. <laughs> look at him always trying to hug her and snuggle her, and he really loves her, and she's taking the kids. Look at her, look at her fixing lunch for the kids. Man. That's, that's, that's epic television right there, right? And he goes to work, and she's working around the house and, you know, serving at the church and doing different things. And, oh, oh look, at, look at him coming home at the end of the day. And he's grilling some steak. <laughs> some of you would like to watch that. That's good stuff. And look at him around the table. Man, I tell you what, what a, what a great story. And look, oh, it's 9 o'clock, and they're getting ready for bed. Look at them going to bed. You know, I mean, it's just not that exciting, right? It's not that exciting. I mean, I love it. It's my life. I think it's incredible. It's amazing, and it keeps getting better. But nobody wants to watch that. And who wants to watch married people having sex? Like, no one wants to watch that show. It's not. It's like 50 shades of gray sweatpants. It's just, <laughs> you, you know, it's just not the kind of thing. But see, here's the, here's the deal. Here's the deal. I'm going to celebrate 17 years. Can I tell you, it's incredible. It's incredible. Getting to know somebody at that level is amazing. But we had to push back from the myths and the lies that our world wants to feed us. And so we've got to debunk this right person myth. And that's what I want to do in the, remaining, the remainder of the time that we have together. I want you to write this down. Here's how we debunk the right person myth. We've got to, we've got to do this. Look at this. Rather, write this down. Rather than finding the right person, become the right person. Rather than finding the right person, become the right person. Here's an idea. Instead of spending your time searching and looking and shopping for the right person, Mr. Right, Miss Right, 
What if you spent time becoming the right person? I mean, if I were to ask you, tell me what you're looking for in somebody to date or somebody to marry, you'd list off some qualities and characters and personalities and traits and all this stuff that you're, you're looking for. So you know what you're looking for. Here's my question to you. Are you becoming the person that the person you're looking for is looking for? I mean, like, whoa, 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 back up. Are you becoming the person that the person you're looking for is looking for? Personalize it. Ask yourself this. Am I becoming the person that the person I'm looking for is looking for? That's a great question. So I know what I'm looking for, right? I want somebody that is into, you know, adventure and loves outdoors. Okay. Am I the kind of person that that person is going to be looking for? I want somebody that's, you know, smart and, you know, really you know, brilliant when it comes to books. Okay. Am I the kind of person that that person is looking for? I want somebody that has a passion for God. Okay. Am I becoming the kind of person that that person would be looking for? This is an amazing question to ask. Or are we just hoping? Or are we just hoping that when we meet the right person, find this person, that they're just going to magically overlook reality and fall for us anyway? Right? That's a great question to ask ourselves. Are we just hoping that they'll fall for us even though we're not becoming the person that the person we're looking for is looking for? You know, as I was prepping for this message, I heard a pastor share the story that I just thought, that's an amazing story, and I want to share it. He told a story about a young 20-some, 20-something young lady. And this young lady grew up in church. She grew up in a godly home, parents teaching her about a love for God, a love for Jesus. And, and she, so she had this great upbringing. But she, when she went off to college, she just saw the way that her friends were living life. And it seemed like they were having so much fun. And they were going from date to date to date. And she just thought, you know what, I'm, I, I want to experience a little bit of what everybody else is experiencing. And, and I'm not saying I don't believe in God anymore. I'm just going to put it on the back burner. I'm just going to set it to the side for a little bit. And so she got into that scene and she got into the dates and she got into the relationships and she got into the intimacy and she got into experiencing things and she felt the, 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 the heartache and she felt the regret and she felt the shame, but she told herself this was normal. This is what everybody goes through in their quest to discover and to explore who they are and who they're looking for. And then all of a sudden one night she explains being at a party and a guy came walking in. And from the moment he walked in, like, you know, she was like, whoa, that, that guy looks good. And she says, this guy was like the total package, her words. The total package. He, you know, good looking guy, fit, had a great job, had a great apartment. And the more she got to know him over the days and weeks to come, not only was this guy the total package, but he actually talked about God like he had a relationship with him. Talked about going to church. Talked about Jesus. And she, she just got so excited. And so one of the weekends that she was at home, she was there on the bed folding laundry with her mom. And of course, you know, having girl talk, talking to her mom about this guy. And this guy's amazing. This guy loves Jesus. And it's just everything that I've ever wanted. And it's interesting because as the story goes on, the mom paused for a moment and put her laundry down and just simply said, sweetie, sweetie, um, I hate to say this to you, but guys like him aren't looking for girls like you. And all of a sudden in that moment, this young 20-something girl dropped her laundry and dropped to the floor and just began to weep because she knew her mom was right. She knew everything she wanted in a guy, but she was not becoming the kind of person that that guy would even be interested in. And so the most important question we can ask ourselves is simply this, who am I becoming? Who am I becoming? Now, the great part of the story is this was a wake-up call for this young lady. And she said, you know what, I'm returning to my roots. I'm going back to, uh, you know, God is a priority in my life. And God, and you know, God's amazing at the way he can pick up the pieces and the brokenness of our life and restore us. It's what God does. And he did just that in her life. And so the important question is, who am I becoming? Not who am I looking for, what am I trying to find, but who am I becoming? And here's what's interesting. When you open your Bibles... And you open your Bibles looking for insight on dating and looking for insight on trying to find the right person, you don't find a whole lot of insight. But when you open your Bibles with the idea, God, show me who I should become, you realize that the Bible is full from cover to cover with insight and instructions on how to become the kind of person worth finding. It's amazing what we find. And when we realize that God put desires in our heart, 
desires to be in a relationship, desires to, to have somebody in our life, desires to, desires to simply hear the words. When you pull in the driveway, just a sense of calm comes over me in the house and the kids look forward to seeing you and I look forward to seeing you. Like God put those desires deep inside of us. And here's what I want you to know. And we're gonna talk about this throughout this series. That marriage is God's idea. And what God creates can work, but we have to be intentional about honoring God through the process and being intentional about becoming the person that the person we're looking for is looking for. So when we ask this question, who am I supposed to become? Who am I supposed to become? I want us to answer that by going to a passage in Scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it, you, you've probably heard this before. This is not going to be new information for anybody. If you've ever been to a wedding, there's like a 95% chance you heard these verses read at the wedding. Okay, these verses are written by a guy named the Apostle Paul, and he's basically saying, I want to tell you what love is. You want to know what love is? I want to tell you what love is. This is love. And my instructions to our church is if you'll get really good at living out these qualities, you will become the person that the person you're looking for is looking for. So take your notes out, and let's just fill in the rest of this. What is love? Based right out of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, beginning in verse 4, we're just going to look at a few of these things. And then you can go read the rest of this for yourself. But what is love? So who am I supposed to become? Who am I supposed to become? Here's the first thing. Love is, write this down, love is patient. Who should I become? I should become someone who is patient. What does it mean love is patient? What does it mean I'm supposed to become somebody who is patient? Here's the thing. What is patience? If love is patient, then we need to understand that love never pressures the other person. Love never pressures the other person. Love creates as much space as the other person needs. I can tell you this much. If you've been in a relationship or you are in a relationship and someone is pressuring you, pressuring you to do, th do something you're not comfortable doing, pressure, pressuring you to be somebody that you don't feel like you were created to be, pressuring you to, to speed things along, listen, I don't know what that person is doing, but I can tell you they're not loving you because love is patient. And patience is a sign of maturity. Can I tell you, an impatient person does not become patient the day they say, I do. You do not go from, uh, you know, give me, give me, I want mine, I want it now, to all of a sudden, I'm a patient individual simply because I walked down an altar and made promises. Patience is a sign of maturity. I mean, if you're a parent and you have kids, you know, when your kid is little, they want it and they want it now. And that's kind of funny and kind of cute when they're little, but when they're like 21, 22, 23 in a relationship, that's scary. That should be a warning sign. Love is patient. Who should I become? I should become someone who is patient. Here's the second thing. Paul says this. He says, love is kind. Kind. What does it mean to be kind? Let me give you another word for kind. Another word would be considerate. Love is considerate. Love takes into consideration the feelings, the dreams of the other person. Have you ever been in a relationship where it's all about them? They're all about me, myself, and I. They're not a very kind person. And they won't become kind the moment that they get married. you got to be willing to look at the track record of the individual. Love is kind. Don't wait until you find the right person to begin to be a kind person. Kind says, I'm going to put your needs, your wants ahead of my own. That's what it means to be kind. Look at number three. It continues on. It says, love does not envy. Love is not envious. It's not envy. What does it mean to envy? What does it mean to be full of envy? Here's what envy means. Envy is when I don't feel so good about me, so I'm not going to let you feel real good about you. See, envy takes all of my insecurities and thrusts them upon you. And, and envy comes out in moments where maybe somebody's sharing a story about their life, about a great achievement or accomplishment, and you can't let them revel in the glory of their moment. You have to then tell them the story about how you did something slightly bigger than what they did. Because it makes you look like a bigger person. That's envious. That's envy. And, and envy rips apart relationships. Oftentimes you'll see this in a couple that's married and a spouse gets a promotion. And the husband can't let her have her moment because it makes him feel smaller. And so he belittles her to make him feel like a bigger person. And love doesn't do that. Love celebrates the accomplishments. Love lets someone tell a story and they sit quiet. They sit back and they shut up and they just say, that's awesome. That's so awesome what you did. I'm so proud of you. That's incredible. And love just lets them have that moment and celebrates their success and their victory. Here's number four. Love does not boast. It is not proud. What does it mean to boast? To boast means to speak 
pridefully about something, to brag about things. Now, some of you are like, oh, okay, so I'm supposed to be patient. I'm supposed to be kind and considerate. I'm supposed to not envy. I'm not supposed to, you know, to, to boast or to be rude, proud. or rude. I mean, like, if I put this in play on my next date, this is going to be the most boring date ever, right? I'm just, you know, no, no, you first. No, no, after you. No, where do you want to go? I don't know where do you want to go. What do you do? I, you know, no, 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 that's a great story. That's amazing. I'm, you're just so awesome, and, right? And you're thinking, this, is a, this doesn't sound like an exciting date. I'm not going to get a second date if I do that. Look, here's all I'm saying. I don't know what your home life was like growing up. But chances are, chances are in your home there would have been more peace. There would have been more harmony if maybe your father, maybe your dad had been more patient with your mom. Or maybe the words your mom used to speak to your dad would have been more kind and considerate. Or maybe instead of being prideful and never admitting when they're wrong, they had swallowed their pride and been willing to admit their failures and apologize. Just maybe the relationship would have been healthier, would have been better. See, I know it doesn't sound like a great date night, but I can tell you what, it does make for an incredible relationship. So let's keep going. Let me, let me give you number five. Number five, love does not dishonor others. Love doesn't dishonor. It doesn't dishonor the person you're on a date with, your spouse. Love is not dishonoring. What does it mean to, to dishonor? It means this. When you, when you date, when you go on a date, you never create regret. When you're on a date, you never create regret. I mean, think back on your relationships. Do you have any regrets? Anybody regret somebody that you went out with? I regret ever going out with them. Does anybody regret going out with you? Do you regret any of the things that you did? If so, you created regret. There was dishonor happening. Another way of saying this is that love does not behave disgracefully, does not behave dishonorably or indecently. I'm just going to call it for what it is. In our world today, those three reasons are a lot of reasons people go on dates. They're like, I want to go on a date so that I can be disgraceful, dishonorable, and indecent. <laughs> Again, I just want to remind you, if that's you, we have a prayer team that would love to meet you. Out back, behind the building, they'll talk to you kindly, patiently, considerately. Here's the thing. It's so important that we understand, who am I becoming? What am I putting in play in my life? And there's so many more things when it comes to this passage in 1 Corinthians 13. We're going to give you a card on your way out, and it looks just like this. It just says love, and it's got 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4 through 7. And my advice is take this home, put it on the bathroom mirror, put it on the dashboard of your car, put it on the refrigerator. Just a reminder, love is patient. It's kind. It doesn't envy. It doesn't boast. It's not proud. It does not dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Anybody married to a scorekeeper here? I'm like, well, this was just like that time back in 78 when you said, it's on there, right? <laughs> Doesn't delight in evil, rejoices with the truth, always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. What should I become? This is going to be a list for you to say, this is who I should become. This is what my life should look like. And as I become this, I am becoming the person that the person I'm looking for is looking for. And it's so important that we've got to be intentional about this because it doesn't happen naturally. What happens naturally is passion, fireworks, chemistry. Yeah, baby, got to get me some of that. That's what happens naturally. But you want a love and a relationship that's going to go from dating to marriage to 25 years to 50 years. Then we've got to focus on who we are becoming, who we're becoming. See, the right person myth says if I meet the right person, everything will be all right. But it's not true. It's not true. We've got to become the right person. Let me close out with 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. So near, near the end of this passage about what love is, the Apostle Paul says this. He says, when I was a child, I talked like a child, and I thought like a child, and I reasoned like a child. Right? When you're a kid, you're a kid. That's just how it is. Then he goes on, but when I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. He's saying, I stopped acting like a child. I grew up. I grew up and I matured. Think about the love stories that we tell to our kids. These fairy tales, right? The knight in shining armor shows up and slays the dragon and rescues the princess in the tall tower. And they ride off in the sunset on his horse and they live happily ever after. Now I hate to burst anyone's bubbles, but do you know where happily ever after happens? Disney. Disney, right? Nobody just happens to happily Live ever after. See, successful relationships, they take work. 
and intentionality. They require two people willing to become the person, the person they're looking for, is looking for. And let me tell you what happens. When you begin to put these qualities in play in your life, patience, kindness, being considerate, not envying, not being boastful, not being proud, not being rude, not keeping a record of wrong. Can I tell you what happens? What happens in your life is that you develop what I call a loser detector. You know what a loser detector is? You see, most of us have a loser detector when our friends go out with a loser. Right? Your friend goes out with a loser and you're like, what are you doing with him? What are you seeing him? He is a loser. Right? But it's amazing. We can't see it in our own lives. We're like, oh, he's so awesome. And your friends are like, uh-uh. No, he's not. But when you become the kind of person that we find in 1 Corinthians 13, and you go out with somebody because they just, they, they look good, and you're like, I want to get to know them better. You go out and you're like, whoa, warning, 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 loser, loser, loser. You just back away. You back away and you're like, this isn't, you know, it's not you, it's me. No, actually it's you, but I'm, and you realize, no, I'm not going to spend my time on somebody that doesn't have the same passion and the same plans and the same desire to become somebody that honors God. And what happens in your life is you save yourself a lifetime of heartache and a lifetime of harm. And here's what I want you to know, is that when we begin to honor God, God's blessing falls on our life. And He'll bring the right person when the time is right. Because you've become someone worth dating and someone worth marrying. Would you guys pray with me?